In this video, we've combined some of the most disturbing cave diving tragedies we've covered on this channel so far. From divers who got lost in the silt, to divers who made a wrong turn and struggled to find their way out. If you enjoy watching these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories like these. Dive into the captivating account of a thrilling diving expedition gone wrong in the alluring waters of Florida's Blue Springs State Park. This story involves friendship, passion, unexpected challenges, and a tragic finale, unraveling the profound implications of diver preparedness and adherence to safety rules. You can discover Blue Springs State Park, located to the west of Orange City, Florida, in the United States. This wonderful park is a favorite among tourists and offers a variety of enjoyable activities. Visitors have the opportunity to partake in canoeing, scuba diving, kayaking, fishing, camping, hiking, observing wildlife, and swimming. One of the remarkable features of the park is its prominent spring, known as Volusia Blue Spring. This spring holds the distinction of being the largest on the St. John's River. Notably, the spring maintains a comfortable temperature of 73 degrees Fahrenheit, which is why numerous Florida manatees are drawn to it during the winter months. Approximately 102 million U.S. gallons of water pour out of Blue Spring into the St. John's River daily. The spring boasts an impressive depth of 120 feet, although only those who have received official cave diving certification are permitted to venture to such depths. Divers who possess open water certification have the opportunity to explore depths of up to 60 feet, where they'll come across a substantial cautionary sign securely fastened at the cave's entrance, advising them to take the warning seriously and retrace their path. Samuel Slack, a 36-year-old man with a passion for diving, lived in Edgewater. His close friend, Daniel Van Sickle, age 37, comes from the town of New Smyrna Beach. Interestingly, Daniel and Samuel shared a unique connection through Crystal, Samuel's wife, as they both worked together at the Garlic Restaurant in New Smyrna Beach. Their friendship had grown over the past year and a half. Samuel held a novice open water diver card, which means he held an introductory level of diving certification, allowing him to explore depths of up to 60 feet underwater. In contrast, Daniel had successfully earned certification as a cavern diver, showing his advanced level of diving proficiency. Despite their differing levels of diving experience, Samuel and Daniel decided to embark on a diving expedition within the waters of Blue Spring. They wanted to explore its underwater wonders and create lasting memories. During this particular dive on October 9, 2013, Samuel and Daniel decided to stick together and dive as buddies. This choice aligned with the guidelines set by the authorities of the Florida State Park System to enhance the overall safety of divers. The two divers formally agreed to their plan by signing an agreement indicating their intention to descend to a maximum depth of 60 feet. This predetermined depth is crucial due to the unique characteristics of the cave environment. Beyond the 60-foot mark, the underwater cave structure becomes steeper and shrouded in darkness, posing additional challenges. Divers who have specialized cave or cavern certifications are allowed to use underwater lights to dive beyond this depth. However, Samuel, lacking the required certification, was mandated to stick to the designated 60-foot limit during their buddy diving expedition. Fully equipped and prepared for their underwater adventure, Samuel and Daniel took on their diving gear in preparation for the dive. Daniel, being a certified cavern diver, showed an extra level of vigilance and preparedness by including an additional breathing apparatus, known as a regulator, among his equipment. This added safety measure was intended to provide his buddy with an alternative breathing source in the event of an emergency arising during their dive. Both divers also had wrist-worn dive computers, a handy tool that not only tracked and documented their diving progress, but also displayed essential information, such as their current depth underwater. As they commenced their dive, the initial stages went smoothly, with everything proceeding as planned. 
Remember that Samuel and Daniel had formally agreed to a specific dive depth of 60 feet. However, an unexpected turn of events occurred once they reached the designated depth. Rather than sticking to the agreed-upon limit, the two men decided to venture further, diving to a great depth of 116 feet. During their approximately two-minute stay at this depth, they explored their surroundings. Having completed their underwater exploration at the depths of the spring, Samuel and Daniel started their ascent toward the water surface. Soon the men found themselves at a depth of approximately 80 feet when their difficulties began to unfold. Samuel started experiencing breathing issues and urgently signaled his distress to Daniel by making a throat slash sign, indicating his difficulty breathing properly. Seeing the situation at hand, Daniel quickly passed his regulator to Samuel. This immediate action provided Samuel with a temporary solution to his breathing problem, relieving his distress momentarily. It's important to recall that Daniel carried an extra regulator in his diving equipment. This was intended to be used by his buddy in case of an emergency, precisely like the situation they were now facing. However, an unexpected difficulty arose due to the placement of this extra regulator. It was secured beneath the chest straps of Daniel's buoyancy vest, making it inaccessible when it was needed most. Soon, Daniel signaled for the return of the regulator after approximately 30 seconds. Surprisingly, Samuel held on to the regulator, not wanting to give it back. Daniel quickly moved away from Samuel and took control of the regulator before swimming up to the surface. As soon as he emerged, Daniel shouted for someone in charge of maintenance to dial 911. This occurred just a little while before 3 p.m. Following this, Daniel went back underwater, where he discovered Samuel in an unmoving state at a depth of approximately 100 feet. Samuel was lying on his back and showed no signs of movement. Acting swiftly, Daniel inflated Samuel's flotation device and carefully brought him up to the water surface. After reappearing above water, both Daniel and a park employee attempted to revive Samuel on a platform designated for divers, but their efforts were unfortunately unsuccessful. Soon after, fire rescue and evac paramedics arrived on the scene and continued their life-saving endeavors. Samuel was transported to Florida Hospital Fish Memorial, where his condition deteriorated and he passed away shortly after 3.40 p.m. At the same time, Daniel was transported to Florida Hospital Orlando so he could receive treatment in a specialized chamber designed for decompression sickness. The reason for this action was that when Daniel initially ascended to call for assistance, he rose from a depth of 80 feet without adhering to the necessary decompression stops. Moreover, upon re-entering the water to reach Samuel at a depth of 100 feet, Daniel neglected to follow any decompression stops once again. Decompression sickness, also known as DCS, the Benz, or Quezon disease, arises when an individual fails to undergo proper decompression after being exposed to increased pressure, such as that experienced during scuba diving. This condition can manifest in varying degrees of severity, ranging from mild instances that do not pose an immediate threat to more severe cases resulting in serious injuries. When engaging in scuba diving using compressed air, the diver inhales both oxygen and nitrogen. While the body utilizes oxygen, the nitrogen becomes dissolved within the bloodstream throughout the dive. When you start to swim upwards back to the surface after diving deep underwater, the pressure of the water around you becomes lower. If this change happens too quickly, the nitrogen in your blood doesn't have time to clear. Instead, it separates from your blood and creates bubbles in your tissues or blood vessels. These bubbles made of nitrogen are what lead to decompression sickness. They give you pains in your joints and bones that can be so intense they make you bend over, which is why the condition is called the bends. The process that occurs inside your body during decompression sickness is quite similar to what happens when you open a fizzy drink. Imagine that when you open a can or bottle, the pressure around the liquid inside becomes lower, causing the gas to escape from the liquid in the form of bubbles. Similarly, if nitrogen bubbles form in your blood, they can harm your blood vessels and block the normal flow of blood. 
This can lead to problems in your body due to the blocked blood vessels. The analysis of the post-mortem report on Samuel's body did not uncover any noticeable or easily seen injuries. According to the report findings, Samuel's passing was determined to be the result of an accidental drowning. Further checking of his diving tank revealed that it contained around 2,100 pounds of pressure or air, which would have been enough for him to surface easily. However, as indicated in the sheriff's report, it was revealed that the valve on Samuel's tank had been turned to shut off by less than a quarter of a full rotation. This position was not considered standard for normal operation. Typically, divers are expected to fully open the valve, which may require several rotations, and then turn it back half a rotation. Failure to open the valve fully can lead to breathing difficulties and potentially result in a deadly outcome for the diver. The valve must be fully open to ensure proper airflow and safe diving conditions. A 33-year-old cave diver set out on her first dive exploration in Indian Springs. She enlisted the help of a more advanced diver and friend. However, while making their exit, a narrow passageway posed a threat to their safety. In Florida, there's a place called the Woodville Karst Plain. This place stretches from Tallahassee to the Gulf of Mexico and covers an area of about 400 square miles. This place is unique because it's what we call a karst landscape, meaning it's made up of rocks, particularly limestone, that can easily be dissolved in water. When rainwater or other flowing water comes into contact with this soft limestone, it gradually wears it away over time. Because of this gradual erosion, karst landscapes often have interesting features, both above and below the ground. Underground, you can find caves, hidden streams, and sinkholes. One of the ways you can access this extensive cave system from the surface is through a rather ordinary-looking pond called Indian Springs which is located in Wakula County, Florida. This beautiful spring can be found on a private property south of Tallahassee, near the Bethel community. Don't let its appearance fool you, because beneath this seemingly ordinary pond with a calm surface lies the entrance to the Indian Springs cave system, which is one of the most popular caves in Florida. This underground world goes down to at least 300 feet and extends for at least two miles. Therefore, before anyone can be granted access to dive there, certain requirements have to be met. This means the diver must have diving expertise, be specifically trained, and be able to use trimix breathing gases with a custom mix of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium. Apparently, for any diver to be able to meet these requirements, it means that they have undergone an adequate training that qualifies them to navigate the underwater world of Indian Springs safely. It is advised that those with less experience dive under the supervision of a qualified guide at all times. Ella Parker was a 33-year-old divorced storekeeper. She fell in love with diving while she went on a trip in college, and ever since, she's made it her life's mission to dive everywhere she finds a cave. To all who cared to listen, she always found a way to preach the gospel of the serenity of the underwater world. The day she became certified as a cave diver was one of her happiest, and she even threw a party. Ever since then, she had gone on almost 150 cave dives. One day, she read about Indian Springs and had since set her sights on the cave. However, due to the dangerous nature of the cave and the fact that divers must be supervised by qualified guides at all times, she sought the help of a friend who was a more advanced diver, Lewis. Luckily, Lewis was down for the dive, and they began preparations for the dive day. On that bright morning, Ella and Lewis arrived at Indian Springs and were prepared to enter the water. They walked toward the spring, which is a little pond that is visible in a clearing surrounded by trees. They walked toward the boardwalk that goes down to the waterside. After suiting up, they went over their dive plan again, which was to dive all the way to the Wakula Room which is approximately 4,500 feet upstream. During their preparatory dive, they had set up stage tanks in different locations within the cave. Lewis dipped below the pond surface, and Ella followed closely behind. Slowly, they dove to the bottom of the pond, and soon they could see the cave entrance. When diving in Indian Springs, 
Once the diver gets to the pond floor, they can see the cavern that eventually turns into Indian Springs Cave. Ella was amazed by the beauty she was seeing, and with Lewis still in the lead, the divers went through the cavern, leading them into a tunnel. This tunnel went on for a couple hundred feet until they got to an area known as Squaw's Restriction. At this point, Lewis looked over at Ella and asked if she was fine. She gave a thumbs up signal to indicate that she was okay, so they continued on their journey. Right from the Squaw's Restriction, the cave began to grow narrower so they had to be careful not to disturb the mud in that section, which could lead to reduced visibility. After going on for a while, they got to a point in the tunnel that they had to slow down and go through one after the other with their equipment. Lewis went through first, and once he had exited the tunnel safely, Ella dove through next, and she ensured she was really careful. Eventually, she made it through. At the other end, she met a waiting Lewis and looking around, she saw that the tunnel opened up to a series of windings. It was a spectacular sight, because these tunnels are made of rough yellow and white limestone. It was a beautiful sight to behold. However, at this point, they ensured they were guided by permanent guidelines that were fixed in this section. The area is prone to silting out easily, hence the permanent guidelines, which usually cover the entire area. From here, Ella and Lewis dove through the winding tunnels, and this was the pathway that would lead them to their destination. Later, they finally got to the Wakula room, which was a huge room. Ella was so happy that she gave Lewis a high five. It was more beautiful than she had imagined. They began exploring every section of the room. After a while, they began to exit. While diving back, they got to where they had staged their nitrox bottles and they picked them up. They still had enough gas to help them make their ascent successfully. At this point, one could think, what could go wrong? The divers retraced their path as they exited. When they got to a distinctive 500-foot arrow marker on the guideline, Lewis checked on Ella. Seeing that she was doing just fine, Lewis continued to lead the way. They dove through the winding tunnels, and the next stage was to head to Squaw's Restriction through the narrow cave. Lewis dove through first, and it was Ella's turn to follow suit. At the Squaw's Restriction, Lewis waited for Ella so they could continue on their ascent. However, he realized she was taking longer than expected. He began to grow worried. Still hopeful, he waited for a few minutes, and when he didn't see her coming, he decided to go after her. On approaching the narrow section, he was met with an unusual and unexpected sight. Right where only a single diver and their equipment could get through at once, Lewis saw his friend there, stuck. Her tank had been caught in a loose guideline, and with the limited space, she was unable to move around to free herself. Lewis thought about how this could have happened. He had not noticed this guideline earlier, otherwise he could have notified Ella. Distraught, he tried to see what he could do, but there was nothing. Furthermore, he realized that the section was gradually getting silted out. In a bid to free herself, Ella kicked up some silt. At this point, their stage bottles were running out and would soon get empty. This was horrifying to think about. Lewis tried directing Ella on how to twist and turn, but it only resulted in more silt disturbance. And when he checked his pressure gauge again, he realized the air was getting critically low. With a heavy heart, Lewis had to summon the courage to leave Ella there and go seek help. He was hoping that a miracle would arise in this hopeless situation. He assured her that he was going to get help, even though she did not want him to leave her alone. Fear was quite visible across her face, and her eyes begged to be saved. Then, almost completely out of gas and with fear in his heart, Lewis raced up to the next set of bottles, which was a hundred feet up. He got there just in time, but despite making it to the bottles, his heart was heavy and a sad feeling washed over him, especially seeing the bottle that Ella should have used. He was horrified as he made his ascent. Immediately after Lewis broke the surface and got out, he raised an alarm and the divers on the ground quickly gathered around him. He narrated the whole ordeal to them begging them to help save his friend, although he feared she had already run out of oxygen. 
About one hour later, two rescue divers made their way to the section where Ella got stuck, and their fear was confirmed. She had breathed her last, and her lifeless body was still held in between the narrow sections. Given the depth of the incident and the condition in which she was found, the retrieval of her body was complicated. After two unsuccessful attempts at bringing her out for two days, a much more experienced diver, who had done several similar rescue dives, was able to retrieve her body and bring her back to the surface. As a medical student and cave diving enthusiast, Steve McAtee has seen his fair share of danger. But nothing could prepare him for the heart-pumping adventure he was about to embark on in the Great Crystal Cave. While visiting his hometown in Kentucky, Steve couldn't resist the pull of the Great Crystal Cave. However, his survival hung in the balance when he encountered an unknown passageway. Would he be able to navigate his way out safely? Would he survive this dive? The Flint Ridge Cave System is a vast and intricate network of caves and underground rivers that stretches throughout the west central region of Kentucky in the United States. Located entirely within the Mammoth Cave National Park, the surveyed areas of this system are awe-inspiring and filled with endless possibilities for exploration and discovery. Flint Ridge, the plateau that houses the cave system, is characterized by a layer of resistant sandstone and shale that serves as its cap. This layer is underlain by hundreds of feet of limestone, which has been subjected to the corrosive effects of acidic groundwater over time. As the groundwater seeps through the layers of limestone, it gradually dissolves and carries away portions of the rock. At the heart of this system lies Floyd Collins Crystal Cave, which serves as the hub and gateway to the entire Flint Ridge Cave system. With its glittering crystals, twisting passages, and underground waterways, this stunning cave is a testament to the beauty and wonder of the natural world. In September 1917, Floyd Collins was climbing up a bluff on the Collins farm when he noticed something unusual. Cool air was coming from a small hole in the ground. Intrigued, he widened the hole and peered inside, only to discover a cavity that was part of a passage blocked by the breakdown. Undeterred by this setback, Floyd continued to excavate the breakdown, determined to uncover whatever lay beyond. Finally, in December of that same year, he made a breakthrough. He had discovered the sinkhole entrance to what would become known as the Great Crystal Cave. Excited by his discovery, Floyd shared his find with Lee Collins, who was equally impressed. In recognition of his hard work, Lee deeded Floyd a half-interest in the cave, and together they decided to turn it into a commercial venture. The entire family set to work preparing the cave for visitors, putting in countless hours of effort to transform it into a show cave that would attract tourists from far and wide. Finally, in April 1918, the cave was ready for its grand opening. Despite the family's tremendous efforts, the cave struggled to attract visitors due to its remote location. Steve McAtee was a 27-year-old caver whose passion for caving was second to none. For him, caving was more than just a hobby, it was a way of life. He spent most of his free time exploring caves, often with his closest friends, in a never-ending quest for adventure and discovery. From an early age, Steve had been fascinated by the world of caving. He used to explore caves with his father and brother since childhood, and this instilled in him a love for exploration that would stay with him for the rest of his life. Apart from his family, Steve also explored caves with his friends, Henry Nelson and Liam Hughes. They were childhood friends, and they all had a passion for swimming while growing up. As Steve grew older, his interest in caving only intensified. He became more experienced and skilled, learning the ins and outs of the sport and discovering new and exciting caves along the way. Steve visited his family after being away at his medical school for a long time. While he was there, he decided to embark on an adventure to explore the Great Crystal Cave with two of his friends. Henry and Liam, whom he had not seen for quite some time. Upon their arrival at the cave at approximately 8 a.m., they meticulously studied the cave's map and strategized their diving plan. 
The trio had decided to explore no more than 98 feet into the cave before they exited so as not to overextend themselves. They thoroughly examined their diving equipment and ensured that everything was in proper working order. After doing so, they donned their gear and began their dive at precisely 8.30 a.m. When they had dived for a while, they eventually exited the cave. However, Steve was not quite satisfied with the extent of their exploration and felt compelled to return to the cave to further delve into its depths. Steve suggested to Henry and Liam that they return in two days, which would be on a Wednesday, given that he was due to leave on Friday. To his dismay, Henry was set to travel out of town while Liam had a pre-existing appointment. Despite this setback, Steve remained steadfast in his desire to explore the cave and informed Liam of his plan to dive alone. He shared his detailed dive plan with Liam, disclosing that he intended to dive to a depth of 131 feet. Liam told him that by the time he returned to the surface, he should be back, and he would contact him to inquire about how the exploration went. On a bright Wednesday morning, Steve arrived at Crystal Cave filled with anticipation and excitement for his solo diving expedition. After having meticulously checked and ensured that all his diving equipment was functioning optimally, he began his dive at precisely 8.40 a.m. With each stroke, Steve marveled at the breathtaking scenery that lay before him, taking in every detail with a sense of awe and wonder. As he continued to dive, he felt an intense desire to push his limits and explore further than his initial 131-foot depth. Fueled by this sense of adventure and exploration, Steve continued to push himself deeper and deeper into the cave, until he missed the actual tunnel he was supposed to take, mistakenly entering a region he was not familiar with and one where the visibility was extremely low. He began crawling through the tiny entrance, and he suddenly realized that he had made a catastrophic mistake. The space he had entered was only 10 inches across and a mere 18 inches high, leaving him with no room to breathe or move. Despite his best efforts, Steve was unable to turn around and extricate himself from the narrow passageway, as the tightness of the space prevented him from doing so. To put it plainly, he was stuck. Upon Liam's return, he phoned Steve to inquire about his dive, but he tried repeatedly with no response. As a result, he grew concerned that Steve might still be diving, which was unlikely. Therefore, he contacted Steve's father to check if he was home, but he was informed that Steve had not yet returned. Liam hastily drove to Crystal Cave, hoping that his friend was safe. When he arrived at the cave, he noticed Steve's vehicle, causing his heart to skip a beat. He attempted to call Steve's phone again, but it rang continuously. Liam approached the truck and heard the ringing phone. He inquired if anyone had seen Steve leaving the cave, but no one had. Consequently, he alerted the cave officials of the possible danger that his friend might be in, and two rescue divers were immediately summoned to the scene. Liam also contacted Steve's father, Harry, to inform him of the situation. Harry promptly set out for the cave without delay. After suiting up and checking their gear properly, Liam informed the rescue team about Steve's dive plan, providing them with the necessary information to begin the dive. Once they were all set, they set out into the water and began their descent. They dived further, following Steve's dive plan. They eventually stumbled upon Steve's body, which was lodged in the narrow passage. It was at that moment that they realized that he had made a fatal mistake and had taken a wrong turn causing him to run out of air and become trapped. Despite their best efforts, the team was unable to retrieve Steve's body due to the difficulty of the passage and the amount of silt that had kicked up during their initial recovery attempt. To avoid any further danger, they decided to abandon their efforts and return at a later time with more experienced divers and better visibility. The following day, two experienced recovery divers joined the team and together they were able to retrieve Steve's body after a three-hour-long operation. However, it was not a pleasant sight, as his joints had become dislocated from being pulled out of the confined space and trapped for so long. Using the information gathered from the dive profile and the cave map, 
experts were able to piece together the sequence of events that led to Steve's tragic death. The autopsy revealed that he had drowned, and it was estimated that he had been stuck in the passage for around 35 minutes before running out of air. Steve's loved ones grieved his untimely passing, but they also honored his memory for having lived a rich and fulfilling life. While it may appear that even seasoned professionals cannot be entirely cautious when cave diving, isn't taking risks a fundamental aspect of living? To all those who engage in cave diving, remember to prioritize safety and adhere strictly to all diving protocols. Florida's Blue Spring, which is located in Volusia County, is noteworthy and prominent. This spring is categorized as a first magnitude spring, meaning it releases a minimum of 100 cubic feet of water per second. The term first magnitude refers to the largest springs, and there are a total of 27 of these in Florida. Blue Spring ranks as the 17th largest in terms of water release among these 27 springs. Blue Spring State Park is a top spring in Florida and the largest on the St. Johns River. The first magnitude spring releases water close to a depth of about 240 feet and has dimensions of about 360 by 160 feet, which is equivalent to the size of a soccer field. It's a natural sanctuary for the endangered West Indian manatees during the winter. Aside from manatees, Blue Spring also hosts a diverse range of freshwater and saltwater fish. The spring opening at Blue Spring is approximately 20 feet deep from the land surface and is connected to a 125-foot cave system. This cave is a popular destination for cave divers. The spring is divided into three areas. One area is accessible to all visitors, while another is strictly off-limits to protect the manatee sanctuary. The third area, designated as the second manatee refuge, is open to visitors who want to observe the manatees. Additionally, the Amerindian Temple Mound is located at Blue Spring, where Native Americans, also known as Amerindians, lived before the Europeans arrived in North and South America. Julian, a resident of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, has been passionate about diving since he was a teenager. His love for the underwater world has taken him to different cave systems across Florida, Mexico, and South America. Apart from his interest in diving, Julian is also an avid climber. He finds solace and thrill in the breathtaking views from the top of the mountains. His adventures in climbing have taken him to various parts of the world, exploring the beauty of nature and testing his limits. Julian is known to be a dedicated and serious individual who puts his heart and soul into everything he does. His focus is to build a career in diving, and he aspires to become a diving instructor after completing his training and fulfilling all the requirements. Julian and his friend Todd Williams, who is also a qualified diver, have always been fascinated by the underwater world. They had planned to explore the cave system at Blue Spring in the past, but unfavorable weather conditions forced them to abandon their plans. However, they were determined to return to the site someday and complete their dive. Two years later, Julian and Todd found themselves in the vicinity of Blue Spring with an opportunity to finally explore the cave system they had longed to see. Despite their diving experience, they knew that the Volusia cave system was unfamiliar territory, so they decided to hire a dive guide named Marcus. Marcus had extensive knowledge of the Volusia cave system, and he shared valuable insights with Julian and Todd before the dive. He pointed out potential hazards and helped them navigate through the cave system safely. The morning of the dive at Blue Spring had finally arrived and Julian, Todd, and Marcus were ready to explore the cave system. They got suited up and began their preparations for the dive. Before descending, they conducted buoyancy checks at a depth of 23 feet to ensure they were all comfortable and ready for the dive. Although Todd was showing signs of nervousness, they both exchanged OK signals with Marcus, indicating that they were ready to proceed with the dive. They began their descent into the cave system, as they ventured further into the cave, Todd began to feel uneasy and signaled to Julian and Marcus that he wanted to end the dive and wait for them on the surface. 
Julian and Marcus, who were determined to continue the dive, reassured Todd that they would be back soon and that he should wait for them at the surface. With Todd safely on the surface, Julian and Marcus continued the dive, eager to explore more of the cave system. They swam through the narrow passages, marveling at the stunning rock formations and the fascinating marine life that surrounded them. After a while, they decided it was time to start their ascent to the surface. As Julian and Marcus made their way back after a successful exploration of the cave system, Julian began to feel increasingly nervous. He started to panic and lose focus, which was immediately noticeable to Marcus, who was following closely behind. Concerned about Julian's condition, Marcus asked if he needed help, but Julian insisted that he could manage on his own. However, Marcus continued to keep a close eye on him, knowing that panic can quickly escalate in a diving situation. Suddenly, Marcus noticed that Julian was dumping gas from his buoyancy control device, and then he started to descend again. Marcus quickly swam over to Julian to assess the situation, and noticed that he was frantically signaling to go up in a hurry. Marcus realized that Julian was in a state of panic and needed to be calmed down to allow for a controlled ascent. He tried to communicate with Julian, urging him to take deep breaths and relax to allow a controlled ascent. As they began their ascent, Julian's behavior became increasingly erratic. He was alternately swinging his arm and gripping Marcus's arms, causing him to lose his regulator twice. Marcus, an experienced diver, quickly went behind Julian and held on to his cylinder handle as he swam him toward the guideline. Once they were properly aligned, Marcus changed his position to face Julian and they started to ascend together. Julian continued to grip Marcus tightly by both his upper arms, which left noticeable indentations and slight bruising on Marcus's skin after he removed his wetsuit. Despite the challenging circumstances, Marcus remained calm and collected, using Julian's BCD to control their ascent while he dumped his own BCD. After ascending 22 feet, Julian lost his regulator once again, and Marcus quickly replaced it in his mouth. Marcus noticed that Julian's breathing had become rapid and shallow. At eight feet, Marcus noticed that Julian was foaming at the mouth and that the foam was coming out through his regulator. Julian appeared to be unconscious, but he was still exhaling and white foam was filling his mask. Marcus knew that Julian was in serious trouble and needed immediate help. The pair quickly surfaced and Marcus immediately released Julian's weight belt letting it drop to the seabed. Marcus then removed his own BCD and Julian's BCD to help Julian get more air. He checked Julian's airway and saw that he was still exhaling foam. Marcus knew that time was of the essence and that Julian needed urgent medical attention. Marcus immediately called out to Todd for help, who was nearby, and they both rushed over to Julian. Upon reaching the scene, Todd could see the situation of his friend, and the seriousness of the situation caused him to panic. However, he quickly gained his composure, and together with Marcus, they worked to pull Julian out of the water. Marcus placed Julian in Todd's care, who immediately started assessing his condition. Marcus turned his attention to their equipment, which they had to leave behind in the water. They had to retrieve their buoyancy control devices and other gear to ensure that it was not lost in the water. With Todd watching over Julian, Marcus recovered their equipment and made sure that it was secure. Afterward, he returned to Julian, who was still unconscious and exhibiting concerning symptoms. Julian was exhaling foam and vomit, which made it difficult to determine the extent of his injuries. Todd was visibly devastated to see his friend in that helpless position. Marcus immediately called the dive center to alert the emergency services of the life-threatening situation. The staff at the dive center immediately alerted the emergency services who quickly arrived on the scene. An ambulance was dispatched and the paramedics took over Julian's care. Marcus and Todd watched as the ambulance rushed Julian to the nearest hospital. Once they arrived at the hospital, Julian was quickly taken into the emergency room. The doctors and nurses worked to save his life, but unfortunately, despite their best efforts, they were unable to revive him. 
The news was devastating for everyone, especially Marcus and Todd, who had been with Julian during his final moments. The reason for Julian's panic during the dive will forever remain a mystery. However, the events that followed serve as a caution for all divers. Panic is a serious threat to divers, and it can strike at any time, even for experienced divers. All divers need to recognize the signs of panic and take steps to prevent it from happening. Rapid, shallow breathing can lead to hypoxia, which is a condition that occurs when the body is deprived of oxygen. This can cause a buildup of carbon dioxide in the body, which is deadly. The diver can start acting irrationally, breathing faster, and even removing the regulator, which is a critical piece of equipment that allows divers to breathe underwater. In some cases, panic can lead to a diver rushing to the surface. This can be incredibly dangerous, as the rapid ascent can cause the diver to experience decompression sickness, which is also dangerous. Panic responses can also cause a diver to pass out, which can be deadly if they are underwater at the time. For divers with weak hearts, panic can even cause a heart attack. Recognizing the signs of panic is critical for all divers. These signs can include rapid breathing, shaking, sweating, and an elevated heart rate. If a diver experiences these symptoms, it is essential to take action immediately. This may involve taking slow, deep breaths, focusing on a fixed point, and calming oneself down. In extreme cases, it may be necessary to surface slowly and safely end the dive. Two friends embarked on a celebratory dive in the Monk Seal Cave after being certified as professional cave divers. Enthralled by the beauty of the deep, they decided to dive further for 32 feet before ascending. When one of the divers ascended, she realized that her friend, who had been ahead of her on their way up, had not ascended. Medvedinia Spilia, also known as Monk Seal Cave, holds the esteemed title of being the longest cave found on the splendid Bicevo Island, spanning a remarkable distance of 524 feet. This magnificent cave derives its name from the captivating Mediterranean monk seal, paying homage to the presence of these remarkable creatures. Situated at the southernmost point of the island is an area known as Biskop, or Bishop. It rests gracefully on the border of the breathtaking Trezjevac Cove, the cave has an amazing entrance, reaching an impressive height of 88 feet, making it seem that you are going to another realm. This passageway, often referred to as Poseidon's Gate, serves as the gateway into the longest partially submerged sea cave on the eastern side of the Adriatic Sea. However, from the 1960s on, the monk seals gradually vanished from the Adriatic Sea. Only in recent years have these enchanting creatures made a remarkable return to the Adriatic waters once again. The monk seals chose to dwell within these caves, utilizing them as their cherished spawning grounds. Visitors and divers can gain access to this cave with a small boat. Within, they are greeted by a beautiful display of light, particularly during certain times of the day, inviting them to behold its complete splendor. However, after a distance of approximately 131 feet, the cave gradually narrows, stopping any further boat exploration. Haley McCarthy and Stacy Liam are dive buddies who formed a special bond through their shared love for exploring the underwater world. Their journey began when they crossed paths during their training for open water diving certification. From that moment on, they stuck together supporting and encouraging each other throughout their diving endeavors. As they progressed in their diving training, Haley and Stacy were determined to acquire the certification for cave diving together. They made a pact to embark on an extraordinary exploratory dive together. Their destination of choice is the renowned Monk Seal Cave because of its beauty and history. On the appointed day, Haley and Stacy set out for Monk Seal Cave in their privately hired tour boat. At 2.32 p.m., they arrived at their destination, ready to embark on their diving journey. With their diving gear in hand, Haley and Stacy suited up, ensuring that every piece of equipment was securely fastened and in perfect working order. 
Their goal for this dive was to reach a depth of 98 feet. Haley chose twin independent 12-liter cylinders, each filled with Nitrox 27. In addition to her primary cylinders, Haley also carried stage cylinders with different gas mixtures for decompression purposes. She had Nitrox 40 and Nitrox 80 in these cylinders to facilitate her safe ascent back to the surface. Meanwhile, Stacy had chosen a rebreather as her diving apparatus. Stacy's rebreather was configured with Trimix 1260 as the diluent. She also carried a bailout gas cylinder filled with Nitrox 28. They had dive torches with them because it gets darker inside. The duo took a deep breath and entered the water, ready to explore the depths of Monk Seal Cave. As they began their descent, the surrounding environment underwent a subtle transformation. The cave ceiling stretched above them while the water's color became darker. The rocky terrain beneath them created a captivating underwater landscape with no silt deposits that could obstruct visibility. The crystal clear water allowed them to witness the beauty that lay hidden within the depths. Taking a moment to ensure their equipment was functioning correctly, they paused at a depth of 13 feet for a bubble check, a safety procedure to verify that there were no air leaks or equipment malfunctions. At last, they reached the target depth of 98 feet. Mesmerized by the beauty of the underwater world surrounding them, Haley and Stacy decided to explore further. With a shared nod of agreement, they ventured another 32 feet into the depths. Sensing the need to ascend and follow proper decompression protocols, Haley and Stacy signaled to each other that it was time to start their journey back to the surface. While ascending for a distance of 16 feet, they suddenly realized that they had strayed from their actual dive path. They had to compose themselves and diligently observe their surroundings. They carefully checked their map to get back on track. They soon managed to find their way back on the correct path and they breathed a sigh of relief. Approximately 32 feet further along their route, Haley, who was on an open circuit system, deployed a delayed surface marker buoy, or DSMB, which contained a relatively small quantity of gas within it. This is typically done by divers during the concluding stages of their dive. The purpose of the DSMB is to signal their ascent while providing a visual reference point along the line and simultaneously marking their precise position for the surface boat to monitor. It also serves the crucial function of facilitating decompression and ensuring safety stops are efficiently executed. As Stacy continued her ascent, having already ascended approximately 18 feet from their previous location, she deployed her own DSMB. Upon successfully deploying the DSMB, Stacy noticed that Haley had managed to position herself approximately six feet above her. Motivated to bridge the distance between them, Stacy swiftly went faster in her ascent in an attempt to catch up with Haley. However, it became surprisingly obvious that Haley was ascending at an accelerated pace, outpacing Stacy's efforts to close the gap. Stacy decided to slow her ascent, deliberately reducing her speed when she reached a point around 82 feet from their starting point. Intending to reunite with Haley, Stacy decided to continue her ascent at a regular pace while believing that Haley would remain visible along the line of the DSMB. She assumed they would meet up around 39 feet as planned. As Stacy gradually ascended to a depth of 39 feet, she realized that she and her friend had become separated, but she had observed the necessary decompression stops to ensure her safe return. Having fulfilled the requirements for decompression, Stacy resurfaced and made her way back to the dive boat. Although she was not expecting to meet Haley up there, her decompression needs would have been greater due to her using an open circuit system. Haley's DSMB caught Stacy's attention positioned upright and approximately 50% of it submerged. However, a growing sense of concern enveloped Stacy after approximately 35 minutes had elapsed since resurfacing. She requested that the boat move closer, hoping to identify any discernible bubbles that might provide clues about Haley's whereabouts. Unfortunately, despite the boat's closer proximity, no bubbles could be detected. 
This made Stacy worry about Haley's well-being and location. Suiting up again, Stacy dived back into the waters, determined to locate the DSMB, situated approximately 65 feet away. As Stacy swam closer to the DSMB, her eyes detected the presence of the reel, but Haley was nowhere to be seen, leaving Stacy with no choice but to ascend and inform the boat crew about the absence of her friend. Upon retrieving the reel, an investigation revealed that approximately 22 feet of the line had been unspooled, adding another confusion to the unfolding mystery. Acting swiftly, the dive boat skipper immediately initiated a distress signal, urgently issuing a mayday call, while enlisting the assistance of other people to initiate a thorough surface search. A collective effort ensued as a total of six boats, including one RNLI lifeboat, rallied together. They searched the expansive surface in a desperate bid to locate any trace or glimpse of Haley's presence. Despite the relentless search, the anticipated sight of Haley ascending from the depths did not happen. This prompted the deployment of two expert divers, who dived in for a search and rescue. After searching as they dived on, Haley's lifeless body was located at a depth of 72 feet, floating around, a sad confirmation of the fate that had befallen her. Her body was carefully retrieved from the depths and transported to the surface, where the waiting lifeboats stood as they witnessed the tragic turn of events. Examining Haley's diving gear, it was discovered that all cylinders were still filled with gas, and the regulators were found to be functioning as intended, raising concern for the rescuers about the actual reason for her untimely demise. With heavy hearts, Haley's lifeless body was solemnly conveyed back to the shore. After being examined by medical personnel, it was revealed that she had suffered a heart attack. This was the 11th cave diving marathon on this channel. Let us know what you think in the comments section. If you enjoyed watching, Take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.